Shots fired. Listen to this. I'm going to read to you from the commentary of Ramban. Ramban is Nachmanides. He lived just after Maimonides. And he's one of the classic commentators on the Torah. We don't have time to go into his biography, but he is a giant in the world of Torah interpretation. He lived in the 13th century in Spain. Here's what he says. He's commenting on verse 9, verse 9 in chapter 1 of Leviticus. And he quotes Maimonides. And he says, The master, that's Maimonides, said, in the Guide for the Perplexed, the following. In the Guide for the Perplexed, which is Maimonides' book of philosophy on the Torah, he explains philosophically many of the Torah concepts, and a lot of his philosophy we know is what's called rationalist philosophy, and it followed the, Aristotel the Aristotelian school of rationalist philosophy, and he explained the Torah rationally according to this school of thought which was very popular in his time and it made the torah very pleasing and acceptable intellectually for the for his generation but it also came under heavy criticism from other sectors of the world that had a much much more mystical and less rationalistic way of viewing the concepts in the torah and they felt that maimonides had May have done a disservice to the Torah by making its concepts too mundane when they're really much more lofty. And some of that tension is reflected in the commentary of the Ramban, who's more of a Kabbalist, he's more of a mystic, and he takes a more spiritual approach to things, where Maimonides takes a more pragmatic approach to things. So we're going to see some of that tension here. He says like this, Kitam HaKorbanos. What is the reason, says Maimonides, for the sacrifices? Ba'avur Mitzrim Va'akastim. Because the Egyptians and the Chaldeans, Asher Hoyu Yisrael Geirim V'Teshovim Ba'artzam, where the Jews had been strangers in their lands, in the lands of the Babylonians, the, Ka the, the, Kaldoni, the Chaldeans, the Egyptians, they always worshipped cattle and sown, which again is sheep or goats. They worshipped these things. These peoples in, among whom the Jews lived always worshipped these creatures. The Egyptians worshipped the lamb. And the Chaldeans worshipped demons which they pictured as goat-like creatures. So goats represented deities to them, and they worshipped goats. And the people of India until today, says Maimonides, they would never slaughter a cow. True till today. Because of this, so for this reason, God commanded that we must slaughter these three species. Why do we sacrifice cows, lambs, goats? You know why? <laughs> because these are the deities of the other nations. And God says, slaughter them idols. So that it should be known. That the things which people thought was the worst sin you could do to murder a god. Those are the animals that you should sacrifice to God himself. How could you kill these gods? No, 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 no. Not only should we kill them, this is what God wants us to do. He says, take those gods and slaughter them in my name. And offer them to me. Uvo avonos, and that's how our sins are atoned. How? Because that is how the bad beliefs will be healed. That's how we're going to rid ourselves of bad beliefs. Shehemadve These bad beliefs are a sickness of the soul. Because a sickness can only be healed with an antidote that is its opposite. You cure a poison with its opposite. And so our sins, which are caused by a deficiency in connection to Hashem, which ultimately is rooted in idolatry, 
Those sins can be atoned when we root out idolatry by destroying the idols. And the sacrificial system is a service of destruction of idols. And we internalize that ideology and we rid ourselves of foreign ideas and focus once again on Hashem and move away from those poisonous thoughts which caused us to sin and that way our sins are healed. That's Maimonides. Continuing now, Eila Dvarov says Nachmanides now in response. These are his words. Now brace yourselves. Vihine heim divre havai. And these words are nonsense. Ooh. Shots fired. Now, now we have to take a step back here and hear what I'm going to say. You and I should never ever say, except when we're reading the Ramban, that what the Maimonides said is nonsense. Because we cannot approach his level of holiness, his level of sagacity, his level of scholarship. We have no right to, to mar in any way the ideas that Maimonides proposed. We might not understand them. We may have intellectual objections to them, but we should understand that when we're talking about Rashi, we're talking about Ramban, we're talking about Rambam, or anyone of their generation or earlier, they were way smarter than us. And any objection we had, they had a dozen answers ready. So the fact that we don't understand fully the idea doesn't give us a right to criticize the person. Um, and even his ideas not to criticize, but to say, I'm troubled by it. I don't quite understand it. I have objections to it on the following day. But we have to approach with tremendous respect. And the Ramban himself, in his introduction to his commentary, says of the Rambam, Maimonides, that he's my great teacher, and I tremble before him, and he was far greater than me. And he says this throughout his commentaries, both on the Torah and on the, the Talmud. When he, when he objects to Rambam, he kind of does it with the humility of like, what do I know? He's the Rambam. But let me explain why I, I, I object, right? So he, he says, when I go to battle again, he says in the introduction, when I object to the Rambam, I'm going to battle in, with the banner of the Torah. It's not me speaking. I, I, as a person, I would, never, I would never dare speak. He says this. He only lived a generation later. He said, I would never dare speak up against the, 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 the Rambam, Maimonides. But in clarifying the Torah, I, I have to take the gloves off, as we would say. That's an expression, a modern expression. The gloves, gloves off, you know, my chavrusa, my study partner in yeshiva, one of them, uh, uh, Eli Julian, he used, to, he used to really fight in the, in the base medjum, we would learn, he would object in very vociferous language. And I would say, you know, you should be more respectful in the way you speak about the text. And he's like, he's like outside the base medrash, when we're outside the study hall, I have all the reverence in the world for the authors and for the great rabbis. He says, but in the study hall, the gloves come off. Otherwise we can't learn. We have to, we have to engage with the text with our full intellect. And it's only in that context that we can say words of criticism. And that's, we have to contextualize that. We hear the Ramban say that the words of Maimonides are nonsense. We can never say that. But when, but when, it's, when it's time to learn, the gloves come off. So I'm just contextualizing that. We have great reverence for Maimonides. Now we'll continue with the Ramban. No! The purpose of the sacrifice is not just to remove from the hearts of the wicked people their wicked ideas, and from the minds of the of the stupid people. Vakasiv Amar, look what the Torah says, Kim Lechem The sacrifices are called the bread of God. They're called a pleasant smell for him. God loves this. God wants this. God desires this. You're saying there's no intrinsic value in it to God. It's just it's just to, to knock on the bad guy. Now you could say God loves it because it's that. You could you could come up with answers for the for the Rambam from Maimonides. But here Ramban's objective uh, objection from the language of the Torah, it seems that there's a positive purpose here. There's something intrinsically desirable to God, not just an antidote to some evil. 
And here he gives some evidence for it. He says, When Noah came out of the ark, with his three sons, there were no Chaldeans around, there were no Egyptians around. What did he do? Hikrim Korban, he gave a sacrifice. What did he give a sacrifice for? To, 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 to object to the religion of the, of the Egyptians? To object to the religion of the Chaldeans? No, certainly not. Vayita be'ini Hashem, the verse says that it was pleasing in the eyes of God. What was it pleasing to him for? What, what purpose did it serve? You're murdering an animal. And it's not to, it's not to, uh, to, to rid the world of, of idolatry. You're it, Noah. It's you. You're the only guy. And it says in the Torah, Hashem, it's Reach and Yichoach. It says by, when, by Noah's sacrifice, that God smelled the pleasant smell. Omar. And then God said, Aliba, he said in his heart, I shall no longer curse the earth because of man. You see that there was a great benefit to Noah's, to Noah's sacrifice. And let's go further back. Havel, Abel, the son of Adam, before there was any idolatry in the world. In other words, you want to say Noah came after generations that were destroyed for idolatry, and maybe he's making a political statement when he comes out of the ark. You remember that idolatry? There's going to be no more of that. It's a new world. You, you want to say that? But what are you going to say for Abel, the son of Adam, when there was, there was no idolatry ever in existence yet? And he brought sacrifices from his firstborn sheep. From their fats. And it says, God turned toward Hevel and his offering. So God was pleased with Hevel's offering. He was displeased with Cain's offering. Now, if God doesn't care about offerings except to negate idolatry, what's going on over here? It doesn't make sense. So, there, so this is his objection. He says, There was no idolatry in the world. There wasn't a, a schmeck of it, as we would say in Yiddish. There wasn't a smell of it. There wasn't a taste of it. There wasn't a speck of it yet. So what were the sacrifices all about back then? It's more fitting to hear the, this reason that people say about it. It seems like this is not his own idea. He said it's something that has been said, and he is putting his stamp of kashras on it. This is a kosher idea, what I'm about to tell you. Because the deeds of man are completed through thought, speech, and action. Tziva Hashem, Hashem commanded, that when a man will sin, Yavi Korban, he should bring a Korban. I'm not going to translate the word Korban. Yismoch yadav alav. He should do smicha, the leaning on the animal. He should press his hands upon it. Keneged hamasa, and this corresponds to the deeds that he committed with his hands or with the limbs of his body, if you will. Viyisvade bepiv, and he must confess with his mouth. Keneged hadibor, and this corresponds to sinful speech. Viyisrof baish hakerev akloyos, and he has to burn up with fire the innards. Of the animal, Shehim klei hamachshava v'hataiva, which are the implements of what he calls thought and desire. You might say the the internal organs of the animal are what regulate, or the person, of the person are what regulate his emotions and his desires, his bodily desires, and that corresponds to the area of sinful thought. And so we, and it's also it's inwards, the innards, it's the inner part. Like thoughts are are inside, not outside. So, so the innards of the animal are are burned uh, to correspond to the sinful thoughts and desires of a man. The legs of the animal corresponds to a man's hands and feet, shaladam, of the man. Ha'osim kol malachto, which perform his actions. And he throws the blood upon the altar, keneged damo benafsho, corresponding to his own life blood. Listen to this. That a man should think when he performs this service. He sinned against his God with his body, with his spirit. And he is worthy of his blood being spilt 
for what he did. V'yisarif gufo, and he is worthy of his body being burned. Lulei chesed habore, were it not for the kindness of the Creator, shelokach mimenu tmura, that took in his place a substitute, let's be careful, v'chiper hakorban hazeh, and this korban, this korban atoned. Its blood shall be in place of his blood. Nefesh, nefesh, tachas, nefesh. Its spirit in place of his spirit. The Russia every korban connected Russia evor of its limbs in place of his limbs. Vamanois lahachios ben moire hatera. Then the portions of the animal that are not burned on the altar are given to the priests that are the teachers of Torah. And here we not only remove the negative action that he do, that he did through this substitutional atonement, which I'll explain. But we support the proliferation of Torah and good deeds by feeding the teachers of Torah, the Kohan, and the priests. She is palulu olav, and furthermore, sustaining them that they may pray for him. Ve'ela devarim miskablim. These are words that can be accepted. Moishchem asalev, they draw the heart. They're acceptable to the mind. Kedivre agada, like the words of the Gadic teachings of our sages. Now, I just want to pause and go back to the substitutional atonement. We object to the idea that one person can sin and some and another person can suffer for his sins. The prophets object to that. And we object to religions that say that a man was sacrificed as a substitutional atonement. Here, the idea is not that, oh, the animal is going to suffer in my place. And yes, it's true, and we could talk about, we don't have time now, we could talk about another time, the idea that animals are given for our use. We can't murder a human being and sacrifice him. Animals are given to us for our use. We can eat them. We can also use them in the service of God in this way. If you are, have a hard time with that, because you love animals like I do also, we could talk about it another time. It's a bigger topic we don't have time for. But the idea is this. He's not saying, oh, I sinned. Well, instead of me dying here, I'll give the animal. If you were listening carefully, the, what the Ramban is describing is a catharsis, a catharsis of what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? I've rebelled against my God, my creator, my merciful master. How could I have done so bad to someone who has done such good to me? whether it was my thoughts, my speech, my acts, or all three, I, I, I feel sorry. And, he, and he's forced to, to go through this action of offering this animal, which resembles the human being in, in its division of limbs. And he sees the animal going through slaughter and the different parts of it. And he's meant to understand that objectively, because of his because of his negative actions, there ought to be this consequence of, upon him. But God in his mercy is allowing it to be transferred onto an animal so that he should have a catharsis and come to the realization of what he did wrong and repairing his relationship with God. It's a thoughtful process through which the animal is a tool. But if a person disregards the thought process and just says, oh, no problem. If I sin, instead of me dying, the animal dies. It's wor worse than useless. It is abominable. And the, the prophets screamed against us. What do I want your sacrifices for? That's what I commanded. I want animals. I need animals. No, I want you. I want your heart. I want your ear. I want you to listen. I want you to obey. And the sacrificial system is only a tool to bring you through an intellectual, emotional process that has you do teshuva. And without that, it's worse than useless. Now, this is a very powerful explanation of Korbanas, but it's lacking one thing, which I want to fill in in the next five minutes, if you can bear with me. Because what I left out is, what about the sacrifices that are not for sin? Not all the sacrifices are for sin. And dare I say it, maybe the primary purpose of sacrifices is not for sin. And sin is a secondary benefit of some of the sacrifices. But we know that there were sacrifices not for sin. So then what are they for? Because all this really just goes with sin. What are they, they for? So for that, we have a very similar idea expressed in a commentary here called Haksava HaKabbalah. This comment is on the verse in Noah, 
where it says that Noah brought a korban and God smelled the smell. Now we don't see that Noah brought it for a sin. It seems he just brought it as like a thanksgiving, and there's such a thing as a thanksgiving offering. There, there's just ways that I want to give a gift to Hashem as a as an outpouring of my love for Him. I can't give Him a gift really, but I could go through the motions and show my sincerity. So that has nothing to do with sin. So how does the Ramban's view fit into that? So I think it can be easily modulated to this idea expressed in Haksaba HaKabbalah. Very worthwhile. Please bear with me. He says, The simple, plain explanation of the main purpose of the sacrifices is, It is for the purpose of, desire, of God's desire and appeasement and fulfilling his will. Kakosuv, as it's written, it is like we saw in that verse in Leviticus, by his desire, by this person who's bringing the korban, his willingness to bring the korban in front of Hashem, it has to be by his will. What does that mean? Klomer, that is to say, listen to this. And here, many of the commentaries point this out in the wordage of Leviticus. A person should be makriv himself, just to borrow the English translation, he should sacrifice himself. But again, meaning he, from the word karov, close, a person brings himself as an offering to God. I bring my whole self to you, God. Ritzono, his will, v'cheftso, and his desire, lifne Hashem. I give over to you, God, my will and my desire. I want to make your desire into my desire. Look what it says in the verse. Adam kiyakriv mikem korban Hashem. And so people ask, the commentaries ask, why does it why is it Adam, a man, kiyakriv, when he offers, when he brings a sacrifice, mikem from you? Leave out the word Adam. Leave out the word mikem. Just say kiyakriv, korban Hashem. When he, a person, shall Bring a korban to Hashem. He should bring it from the animals. Why Adam? Why Mikem from among you? And so the deeper commentaries say because the Adam Kiyakriv, when he brings an Adam as a korban, when a person brings a man as a sacrifice, what do you mean? We don't do human sacrifice. You accept one thing, yourself. But it doesn't mean to murder yourself physically or to throw yourself on a, on a pyre for God. But you give yourself over to God as an offering. Me come from you, from yourself. You give the your own person over to God. Your desires and your wills, you subjugate to him. And you say, I want to make your will into my will and, my, and, and your desire into my desire. As if the one bringing the korban is showing that he is bringing his self with all the powers of his spirit boro to the service of God. He's giving over everything he has to God. His whole desire, his entire will is only to cling to God. And to ascend upon God's spiritual altar. To ascend upon a spiritual altar, that's what it means to give ourselves as a, as a sacrifice. Yes, there's a physical altar, and we put a physical animal on there as a symbolic service to show, to demonstrate what I want to do to you, God, is to give my whole self over to you on a spiritual altar. Just like down here on earth. He's he's raising up this physical korban. This great love, which is born in the thoughts of the one bringing the korban. And the 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 cleaving to God, the closeness, the attachment to God that is brought into being 
in his desire at the time that he brings his korban, who hanikra ledaiti says this commentator. This is what the Torah refers to when it says reyach nichoach, a pleasing smell, which we said is the pleasing spirit. What is the pleasing spirit? It's the desire of the person to give himself fully spiritually over to God. And it's demonstrated, it's manifested in a physical form in the sacrificial service. And that's before we ever touch on or talk about sin. But as far as how sacrifices are also a vehicle for atonement of sin, it's in the way the Ramban describes it.